So welcome, thanks for joining. Um, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Tig. Uh, I think I know almost all of you on here. Uh, I'm a meditation teacher, a contemplative artist. Uh, so I teach here at the Dharma Collective. Um, also getting ready to launch the Center for Mindfulness at the Mayo Clinic uh, in a few weeks. So teaching there. And um, I also teach for a research study at Brown University um, that is measuring the impact of contemplative practices on young queer adults. Uh, so we're just about to start our um, clinical trials this year. Um, and all of that is informed, uh, even though I teach in secular formats in the hospitals and the universities, all of that is really informed by uh, Dharma by uh, my practice, my personal practice. Um, so it's lovely to be here at the Dharma Collective, uh, where we can really dive into these practices and concepts. Um, so this is uh, class eight uh, in a series of classes exploring ethics. Um, so the name of the series is Embodied Ethics. And tonight we're going to be talking about materialism and uh, this idea that I'm calling um, ethical hedonia. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna dive in and explore that a little bit tonight. Um, so we're really gonna be kind of looking at the sources of our happiness and joy and um, looking at these aspects from an ethical perspective. So making sure that our sources of happiness and pleasure are not causing harm to ourselves, to other people, to the planet. Um, so we'll touch into some of the threads that we've been discussing through the entire series around um, capitalism and our carbon footprint and the destructive nature of um, the way that this world is working right now. So. Um, but let's start with uh, a practice. This will be a little bit longer than what we normally practice for an opening practice, so maybe about 15 minutes, um, just to kind of frame out this practice because there are a couple different parts. So we will start just with a settling in and arriving, um, noticing what's here, and um, then we'll transition into a little bit of um, breath work, just directing the breath to different parts of the body, exploring that. Um, if you don't want to manipulate or change the breath, if that's not feeling comfortable, you're more than welcome to shift your awareness to another object. Um, and then we'll actually do a longer intention setting practice at the end. So as we start to transition into a period of practice, let's find a way of being that allows us to be comfortable yet alert for the next 15 minutes. So maybe making some adjustments to your posture, maybe some last minute stretches, grabbing a cushion or a pillow or a blanket, whatever you need to feel comfortable, settle in. And as we make this transition from the outer world to our inner world, perhaps just softening the gaze, Maybe lowering the eyes down to softly gaze at a surface just in front of you. Or perhaps closing the eyes, whatever's feeling comfortable for you tonight. And as we start to settle into stillness when and if that feels comfortable, let's take a moment just to notice what's here. What's the energy that we're carrying into our session together tonight? Maybe for you, you're noticing an energy in the mind, perhaps some residual energy from activities that happen during the day. Maybe there's a certain mood that you're in. Perhaps taking a moment just to check in with the energy that's in the body right now.
and no expectation of how you should or should not be in this moment, whatever it is that you're discovering and mind, mood, body. Just taking a moment to welcome it. And welcome yourself exactly as you are. Perhaps taking a moment here to notice the steadiness of the ground beneath the body, expressed through the contact that you're making with the chair or cushion or floor. And here we are resting on the ground. Some of us may be thousands of miles away from each other, but we're all here resting on the same ground, the same earth. An invitation here to bring the attention to the breath. Perhaps continuing to breathe in your natural rhythm, no need to force or manipulate the breath, just gently bringing your awareness to the sensations of breathing body. If coming inside the body or bringing your awareness to the breath is not something that's available for you tonight, you can just rest the awareness right outside the tip of the nostrils or the upper lip. Notice the subtle movements of air as you breathe in and out. And the next breath in, imagining that you could direct that breath into all of the muscles of the face. And then as you breathe out, a sense of softening through all of those muscles around the eyes, the jaw. Next breath in, imagining that you could direct that air all the way down into the shoulders. And as you breathe out, allowing a sense of ease and softening to happen in the shoulders, perhaps a dropping down as you exhale. Next breath in, directing that air all the way down the legs of the arms. And then as you breathe out, that same sense of softening and letting go of any tension or squeezing, tightness in the arms. Next breath in, let's send the awareness all the way down into the abdomen, the pelvic floor. And as we breathe out, see if we can bring that same sense of release or softening into these areas of the body. And then on the next breath in, directing that air as if you can breathe all the way down into the legs and the feet. And as you breathe out, relaxing, softening, let the body be held by the support that's beneath it. And maybe you'd like to continue working with the breath for a few more cycles, perhaps breathing as if you could direct that air all the way down the length of the spine to the tailbone. And then as you breathe out, allowing that energy to travel all the way back up the spine to the crown of the head, perhaps a sense of lengthening through the back of the body. And then finally, let's imagine that we could breathe directly into the heart. So we'll stay here for a few breaths, either imagining that you could breathe into and out of the heart center, perhaps just resting your awareness with the heart, the seat of our emotions.
And just letting the attention gently rest in the heart, whether you're still working with visualization of the breath or just the felt experience of the heart pumping in the center of the chest. And keeping part of the attention here in the heart center or the sensation of a breathing heart. And part of the attention turning towards these words by meditation teacher Dennis Warren. This poem is called In the Quiet of This Place. Bring the fear and the shame, the misery and the pain. Bring everything you suspect is dangerous or impure. Bring every broken vow, disappointment, and despair. But also bring the hope of hearing your true voice, of touching your true nature. In the quiet of this place, in the stillness of your heart, you are safe. There's no need to hide anymore. If you listen, listen deeply. If you wait, wait without wanting. Your true voice will speak to you here. A hand from your own heart will reach out to you. So just resting for a few more moments in this quiet place of the heart. Even if the mind is moving quickly, lots of chatter, analysis and thoughts coming through, is it like just to rest the awareness here in the chest? The mind moves away from the awareness of the breathing heart, the spaciousness that we're creating in our awareness. We just use our mindfulness practice to notice that without a judgment. Taking a moment to release whatever it is that carry the attention away and relax as we gently return back to this moment, this breath, this heartbeat, this quiet space. We're going to stay in this space of the practice just a little bit longer. Normally, we talk through some of the intentions and framing for our time together after this practice, but here in this place of the heart, we'll set our intentions together. As this class focuses on ethics and ethical ways of being, the actions and behaviors that arise from our moral principles, perhaps setting an intention to explore these ethics with an open mind, perhaps an intention not to judge ourselves. And as the name of the series of classes is Embodied Ethics, let's take a moment to set an intention to be with the body, stay with our experience that arises during our time together tonight. And an intention here to take care of ourselves, take care of our body, listen for what we may need, take breaks. And here we are in community. So an awareness of others that are sharing this experience with us. Gathering as a community to grow and learn and practice together. 
So let's set an intention here to respect each other, to listen deeply, to avoid causing any harm to another, not giving advice, not trying to fix or change. And appreciating that we all have different lived experiences. We all come into this with different biases and privileges and preferences. And knowing that our diversity is our strength. If there's any other personal intentions you'd like to set quietly in the space of your heart, please do so now. Before we transition out of this practice, let's just take a moment to check in. What's here now? The energy and the mind or the body or the mood shifted at all over the course of this opening practice. And no right or wrong, no way that you should or shouldn't be. We're just checking things out now. An invitation here to follow one more breath deeply into the body if that feels comfortable. And as we exhale, letting go of this practice, perhaps inviting some movement back into the fingers and the toes or making some gentle stretches to help transition out of that period of practice. Returning back to open eyes as you're ready, allowing an awareness of light to return back into the attention. <clears throat> so thank you all for joining me in that practice. Um, so any, I'm, I'm curious, any thoughts on that practice? It's a little bit different than how we normally open our time together. Just seeing that some people have joined while we are in the practice. So hello and welcome. Nice to have you all with us. So yeah, any thoughts what that practice might have been like? We did a little check-in. We did some breathing through the body. We spent some time in this quiet place of the heart, even though the mind might be loud and noisy, the quiet spaciousness of the heart. And then we set our intentions together. So what did you notice in that practice? What came up for you? Uh, so since we're all online tonight, you're welcome to uh, either raise your hand or just unmute yourself and go ahead and speak. This is Cecily. Hi, yeah, I counted to eight. So um, I love this phrase of the setting intentions, but it was confusing until I remembered the list of community, community agreements that EBMC has. And so I picked one of one of those and it was very sweet. And then I forgot which group I was with, but it's okay because we're all Buddhist and you're awesome. So that was fun for me. Check. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, really important to kind of spend that time setting intention. I like to kind of think of this as almost like intention setting is like turning the ship in the direction that we want to go. It's different from a goal. A goal is kind of like knowing the destination that we want to arrive at, where the intention is more kind of like orienting ourselves in the direction that we want to go. And then kind of dropping it and letting it go. We don't need to hold on to that intention. If we do, it's a goal, which is also okay. Yeah, what was it like to breathe into the heart? Mm. 
My heart hurts. And mm. I, I, uh, I experimented with not trying to delve into the story of why and just kind of like, this is the thing that is happening, which is very rare for me. I'm pretty attached to the stories and the whys. Uh, so uh, practice in there, but yeah, ow. Mm. Thanks for being vulnerable and sharing that with us, Tia. And we'll, we'll touch into that a little bit later in the class, but I see a lot of nodding heads and some heart emojis. So thank you for sharing that. For, for me, um, sometimes it's just a blank and empty space. I, I, I have, I struggle with feeling into the heart. It's, I, I guess it's such an ingrained habit to be thinking in the head all the time. It's like when you, I, I, it's a faculty that I need to build or grow, cultivate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, can I ask Angela if it feels comfortable to explore this a little bit more? Did, do, do you, is there a feeling that you should be? You said, you use the word emptiness to kind of describe that. Is there, do you feel like you're expecting to find something there? I'm expecting to find something. It's just a void. It's like nothing. Yeah. Yeah. We'll explore that a little bit more tonight. Thanks for sharing that. I think that's a, that is a very common. Some, sometimes I hear a lot of people, people can't even feel the heart, the physical sensation of the heart, you know, unless we actually like press into our chest, we can't really even feel it. So, yeah, that's a very common experience. Yeah. Thanks all for sharing that. So we're gonna go a little bit deeper into that um, in a few moments, but I wanted to um, start our exploration tonight on um, this kind of idea of moving beyond materialism and this uh, the ideas of, kind of ethical happiness. Um, so those of you who may have heard either me or he talking about these kind of two sources of happiness. Um, one is hedonic happiness and the other is eudaimonia. And hedonic happiness is kind of the joy or the pleasure that comes from external sources. So uh, a gift from a friend or a delicious meal or the sunshine or being here in community. So there's nothing wrong with hedonic happiness in and of itself. We'll talk a little bit about how it can go off track a little bit. But the hedonic happiness is the, the sources of our pleasure and joy that come from the outside, where eudaimonia is kind of considered to be the happiness that comes from within. Um, I like to think of it almost as like our inner light. So there's no, it's independent of external sources. Um, kind of this, I also equate it to this idea of equanimity. So no matter what's happening out, the storms that are raging outside of us, uh, that eudaimonia is something that comes from, it, it's this steadiness or this contentment. It might not always be pleasant, um, but it's its ability to be with whatever's happening externally and not get too swayed, or perhaps it's more realistic to say that we can recover a little bit quicker when it does happen, when we're in that place of eudaimonia. Um, the, there's a term uh, uh, that eudaimonia is referred to as genuine happiness. And I'm not 100% sure if I agree that, um, because I think by saying eudaimonia is genuine happiness, it kind of infers that hedonic happiness is not genuine. But like when we're eating a really good meal or watching a really entertaining show or listening to great music, that's pretty genuine happiness. Uh, so I think both have a genuine um, feel. Uh, yeah, so I, I know Cecily is just asking about the spelling of these two words. So uh, hedonic is H-E-D-O-N-I-C or hedonia with an A. And then eudaimonia, so it's a Greek word, uh, E-U-D-A-E-M-O-N-I-A. I also like to think of, you know, when we think of love, we think of like hedonic, egoic love, like you do this thing, someone does this thing for us and it makes us happy. Um, so that's like an external source of love. A lot of us consider our love in our relationships to be like this, you know, and if somebody stops doing the things that makes us happy, then that can be problematic. 
Whereas Yudha Monet love is more about like a meta type of love. It's like, I, I, I am aware of my sources of happiness. Like I want to share that. I want you to be happy. Um, so we need both, you know, it's not to say, I think I'll just say very clearly through this teaching tonight, in no way am I implying that hedonic pleasure is bad, except when we overdo it, which we're going to talk about next. Um, but I just want to be clear, I'm not promoting that we live a life solely of inner happiness. Um, but it is important when we, when, we, when we explore our sources of happiness and love that we do acknowledge that there are external sources and internal sources. So when they are external sources, we can enjoy, we can savor. You know, we talked about gratitude a few weeks ago. We can be present with those great moments as they're happening. Um, but then not become too overly dependent on, on them because what happens when they're not there? If our happiness is dependent on someone else and they're in a bad mood, does that mean that we're not happy? Or if our happiness is based on some other external source and it doesn't come to fruition or we lose it uh, or it goes away because things aren't permanent, then where, where does that leave us? So enjoy the hedonia, but not be super attached or dependent to it. And we talked about the void. I think that was more in the heart center. And I'm thinking more about a lot of us feel like there's something missing or there is some sort of emptiness or void in our, in our beingness. Um, and sometimes the hedonic happiness can become problematic because we start trying to fill that void with these outside objects. Um, so, you know, I, I want to be really sensitive to um, difficulty like loss and grief and trauma and unmet needs, pressures from society, maladaptive coping mechanisms. These are all things that can lead us to a feeling like we need to fill this void. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about maybe some alternative ways of doing that as we ex explore um, this concept tonight. I think it's pretty obvious about where the harms of this kind of hedonic happiness can come from. Um, you know, we, the, the name of, of the class tonight is about moving beyond materialism. So there's a direct link between materialism and hedonic happiness. Um, they're not exclusive, but they're definitely related. And so these harms that I'm particularly thinking of with hedonia is kind of the overconsumption, the mass production of the, the way that our economy runs right now, uh, and always needing the newest things, uh, fast fashion, the new iPhone. I, I just left my phone on BART on my way here. I lost my phone tonight. It's kind of ironic that I have it in my teaching notes to talk about getting a new phone. <laughs> uh, but you know this the the how problematic the materialism can become so like the, the the carbon footprint and the waste and amazon shipping and you know yes it makes things more convenient and easier um but and it makes us feel more independent but also it's destroying our planet it's creating a lot of problems for our society um, when we depend so much on our external sources for happiness in the extreme, we are fueling a lot of those destructive aspects of capitalism that we've been exploring over the past two months. Um, we know that it's not sustainable to keep growing like this, you know, to, to keep over mass producing, over consuming on many different levels, the carbon footprint of the production, mass production of goods, the packaging, the shipping, um, the resource depletion. Uh, so th it's important to be aware of where our hedonic happiness is coming from and are we swinging into this kind of destructive nature with it? Is it causing problems for us, for other people through capitalism, the oppression that this economic system creates on uh, all different groups that when we're over consuming, we're actually part of that pushing down. So again, it's like where it's different for all of us, but where's the middle path? Where do we consume to meet our needs, but then bring our awareness to where we might be overdoing it a little bit? Um, I think this idea of convenience is, is really sensitive because a lot of us are, are in a paradigm where 
we need things fast and simple because we're just trying to keep our head above water. We're trying to raise families, keep food on the table, keep shelter over our heads. So I am sensitive to that convenience aspect. The invitation is really bringing our awareness to it. And as we've been talking a lot about over the past two months, how do we offset if, if that is something that is true for us? And we do need to rely on some of these aspects of consumption and materialism just to get our basic needs met. Um, so I want to be you know, really sensitive to that. Um, also, this idea, and we, we touched into it with our gifting economy conversations around um, this sense of we all have our own stuff. So we're all independent. We all have our own cookware. We all have our own tools, our own cleaning supplies. So it really, this, this overconsumption or this hedonic materialism allows us to feel like we have everything we need. But when we zoom out, a lot of times I like to think about a city block. How many, how many plastic brooms are in one city block? How many drills are in one city block? If, what if we share? You know, so yeah, it might be a little bit more uh, inconvenient. We might actually have to talk to our neighbors <laughs> and connect with them. But these are just some thoughts that I have, you know, around how, like, when we swing to this kind of extreme of hedon uh, hedonia, that it, it does cause problems for carbon footprint. Um, and the invitation, as I've been saying here, is really just bringing awareness to it. So, What are your thoughts on hedonic happiness versus eudaimonia? We're going to talk a little bit about eudaimonia. So just some of the things that I shared there, what's coming up as you hear these concepts and as it relates to your life about kind of the ethical approach to hedonic happiness? Uh, I'm curious where you're seeing uh, any any differences or what you're seeing the differences between the uh, use of eudaimonia and the concepts that I'm way more familiar with of equanimity. Yeah. Uh, did you say uh, equanimity or uh, what was the last word you said? That I'm more familiar with. Uh, hedon uh, hedonic happiness. Uh, not the hedonic one, the other one. Yeah, you don't want it. So I think, you know, thanks for asking that. Um, I, I think what happens is like, as I've been kind of doing this with my body, like you have these extremes, right? And so when we're on this one side of, of hedonia, which is like over consumption, kind of swinging the pendulum all the way to that side of it, um, it's where it becomes really problematic. And so like, why are we swimming? I mean, it's a question that we all have to ask ourselves, like, why do we swing that far over? For me in my own life, and I'll share some, some of my own personal antidotes a little bit later in the class, but for me, it's this, this sense of something missing or this void that I'm trying to fill with these material objects. And so for me personally, cultivating a sense of inner happiness that's less dependent on material things and, and external objects is what helps me swing towards the middle. Again, I'm not trying to get rid of my hedonic urges. I'm just trying to balance them out in a way that doesn't cause harm for the planet or for other people. So I think it, and I'll, I'll go a little bit further into that, Tia, but it's a great question. I think it's kind of like the arising of the eudaimonia, the inner happiness that helps balance a little bit of the swinging all the way to the destructive side of hedonic happiness. Yeah. I have so many thoughts. And I, I don't, I'm not sure, I, I keep flitting from one to the other. Um, one thought I'll just share, because I, I think I'm, uh, well, two things about it. One, in, uh, in Berkeley, they have a tool lending library. And it's this idea that, yeah, we don't all need our own drill. I mean, obviously, for carpenters, we do. But I use a drill once a year. <laughs> Maybe someone uses drill once a month. So we don't all need our own drill. Um, I really notice that when I'm in 
areas where where there are where it's hot, very hot. And, you know, like you fly into some city in a hot climate and every house has a swimming pool. And it's like, really, every house needs their own swimming pool, you know, and versus, you know, a communal swimming pool. But I think I want to relate that to the, you because you use the word independent twice. And one was this idea that, you know, that of the sort of, how, you know, this is something that's very valued in our culture and, and, you know, we each, I know I value it in some respects of, yeah, I'm independent. I don't need anyone I can, you know, do, do for myself. Right. And that, that sort of sense of independence, which in these examples of the drill, for example, leads to like materialistic overconsumption, Right. But then also you were using it to describe uh, eudaimonic uh, pleasure that's independent of the need for an external source for pleasure, right? So I think um, one of the fruits of, of meditation is, is that's one of the fruits of meditation for me to just be like, I'm good, I'm good. And it's not like... Uh, an exhilarating good necessarily it can be but it's just like no i'm actually good i don't need anything obviously i need food and air and water and um you know human beings for love but (laughs) but there's this so so for me so to kind of wrap that all up i think what you say is very true like there's bringing awareness to this and just really questioning in a, without going crazy over it. Like when you, when you think you want something, do you, do you really want it? Do you need it? Whether it's, you know, some like a material good, you know, or, or is it almost like a distraction from, you know, the pursuit of material goods can take us away from more time meditating, for example, right? And how yeah. would that relate to, to, for you, how would that relate to ethics? Um, well, I, I mean, it goes back to this, the way we're, we're kind of trashing the planet. I mean, that's that's the, the impetus. There's, there's the ethic of like, what is the best thing for me Right. I'm actually happier when I'm spending more time doing things that are uh, fulfilling rather than things that seem like they'll be fulfilling, but aren't because they're just grasping for some fleeting pleasure. Um, But it's also uh, I'm very I'm super aware. I'm sure we all are of just the amount of trash and crap we produce and it's really hard not to because everything that is available for consumption is intended to be thrown away you know it's just uh that's kind of the nature of our material production now you know why are things made to be thrown away because someone makes more money that way, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. Of blessings. Yeah, thank you for your reflections. Uh, what, what comes up for you when you hear what Noam was sharing? Any thoughts on the experiences that we heard him speaking to? Yeah, I guess I'll jump in. I mean, one, this is Tanya. One thing um, is, um, you know, you're talking about how it fills a hole, but I think another thing is, it's, a, and I think Noam says this, it can be, consumption can be a distraction. It's not, not filling a hole of pleasure, but it's distracting from pain. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think, and um I think a lot of our consumption is driven by that, even through advertising and stuff like that as well. So, um, so it can be going after pleasure or avoidance of pain. I think it can go both ways. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that reflection.
I, I, what I'm loving so far, we're hearing all different examples, you know, of where it can be this overconsumption um, can be harmful for us, you know, maladaptive coping mechanisms. We heard Noam talk about the trashing the planet, you know, and then this kind of like um, disconnection or isolation that we feel from each other because we're all feeling so independent. We got, we're trying to get everything that we need so we don't need to re rely on other people. Um, and then we're kind of cutting ourselves off from connection, from community. One of the things that really stayed with me after our conversations last week, we heard three times during that, that class last week, how it feels so overwhelming when we think about big picture or like, how do we scale up ethics or scale up these practices? And it's where there was like a lot of like kind of overwhelm coming from. And then everyone started really feeling, everyone that was sharing started feeling a lot more manageable or approachable when it comes down to a smaller scale. And that just really stayed with me all through the week. And as I was thinking about our class tonight, this, this idea of like the connection of the community, you know, and like sharing, resource-based sharing, gifting economies, those all happen at smaller scales. So all of that feels very related, you know, that this kind of part of the overconsumption, the mass production is this global scale that our economy is operating on that's also causing a lot of problems. So I want to talk for a second about a concept some of you may have heard about um, called post-materialism. And that will transition us into eudaimonia. Um, so for those of you that haven't heard, post-materialism post is a, a term that was coined by Ronald Engelhart, um, and it refers to a shift in society that's characterized by a decrease in the emphasis on material possessions and a greater emphasis on personal fulfillment, self-expression, and quality of life. Uh, it reflects a growing, des a growing desire for non-material values, i.e. ethics. <laughs> environmental sustainability, social justice, spiritual well-being, a lot of the things that we're talking about here. So the argument that Engelhart makes is that as societies become more prosperous and secure, this is based on kind of what happened after the Second World War, where people, some people, not all, really did start coming more into material wealth and stability. Uh, again, clarifying not all, um, but for some people. And, uh, and so that as a result of people having more of their basic needs met, they're kind of safe and secure at that kind of base level of getting their needs met, that they can start to shift to prioritizing self-expression and non-material values. So I've been kind of sitting with this post-materialist era concept for um, about seven or eight years, just thinking through this. And, and I used to think a lot about how um, it was actually the children of this generation that started looking and seeing that their, their, the generation before them has material wealth and they're still not happy. And so that the post-material, post-materialism era would be then when we have younger generations start looking for other sources of happiness outside of the material, uh, material realms. What do you say? Three, seven, six, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's not really happening, you know, and when I return back to Engelhart's theories, like if, if this was true, we would be seeing this, you know, the top percentage of people that have privilege and wealth starting to embody some of these values of, you know, letting go of material, that, right, see, I can see a lot of you are shaking your head, hmm. it's not happening. So why? Why is it not happening? Why are we, even the people that have all the material goods, they still want more, they still have that hungry ghost, they're still clenching onto it, that that hedonic drive is so strong. And for me, I think a lot of it comes down to a lack of ethics. And that's really what the platform of this course is. And so the invitation as we've been exploring kind of these concepts of interconnectivity, of common humanity, our shared beingness, uh, do no harm, altruism, compassion, uh, happiness, these are things that need to be cultivated first before we can move into a post-materialism era. Otherwise, we're just taking more of the hedonia and trying to shove it in there. You know, it's like the hungry ghost, it's got the huge stomach 
and a tiny little pinhole mouth just can't get enough in. Um, so in, from my point of view, until we really establish a baseline of ethics, which is very difficult to do at the societal level, which is why I think we're all here in this class to practice, to learn. And part of what brings us, for those of us that do practice Dharma, it is what brings us to those um, pillars of this system. Um, of being compassionate. We've, we've heard the word tonight. We've been in class for 50 minutes and I think I've heard the word awareness like 10 or 15 times already, right? So bringing our awareness to these sorts of things are really the platform for um, shifting, making this shift. So before we move into eudaimonia, I do want to kind of tie up a loose end with hedonia and what I call ethical. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Karen. Did you have a uh, you're you're muted. I just wanted to make a comment about that because um, I I really feel strongly that what we're all up against is is a a massive um, advertising industry that keeps perpetuating people's um, making us feel like we need things, and it's a huge powerful force. It's everywhere, and we know it's it's almost inescapable. And it takes a lot of awareness to say, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fall prey to this." Yeah, it's yeah, it's very, very powerful. And and your point about it's kind of it's like we talked about the other week. It's all pervasive. It's in our minds now. It's like programmed us, and and that was you know that's been kind of the the cornerstone of this series of classes is that it's, even though I clearly am very anti-capitalist, it's not really what this class is about. It's how do we protect our hearts and our minds from this onslaught of psychological manipulation? As many of you know, I, before I shifted into this incarnation of my life, <laughs> I was a creative director in a, a global marketing organization. And I remember in 2012 being in a meeting and being like, we are psychologically manipulating our customers, A, to think that they need this when they don't, and B, to charge them for it. <laughs> and, and that was the beginning of the end for me, where I was like, I can't do this. you know. And then I think like the next week I saw, we, we were looking at advertising layouts for a campaign and and I saw, I get, sometimes emotion comes up with this. I saw there was like a young woman in one of the advertisements and I have um, a lot of nieces and I just saw my nieces in those women. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm getting chills on my side. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to participate in the objectification of the body in order to sell products. But anyway, sorry, we're not on a tangent. Karen, thank you for that point. I fully agree with that. It does take hyper awareness to really look at these, you know, it's like the fish in the water. It doesn't even know it's in the water. So we have to turn and look. It's super uncomfortable. Um, it's hard. You know, we have to have boundaries um, and we have to get into all of our thought processes and our beliefs and our stories about ourselves that have been influenced by this, this machine. So yes, thank you. Cecily. Hello, um, I'm going to continue your tangent. And Karen, thank you so much for bringing up advertising first. Um, so this, okay. I'm reacting to your um, idea that this is a lack of ethics. Um, and I want to respond with, this is why our country is wealthy. Is what? Wealthy. <laughs> so a quick Google search reminded me that um, the United States economy is based, supported, founded on consumer goods and business services. So if you grew up here, you got that culture of consuming, not because you didn't have strong ethics, but because that was your culture. 
And whether that is moral, it is the culture we're in. And I am responding to the idea that I am bad and that I don't have mm -hmm. ethics. I have exactly mm -hmm. the ethics I was given. And then mm -hmm. I come here and I try to change them. There you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is that, that boom we had after World War II, this, this is what it was based on. That's why mm -hmm. we're here now. Yeah. So I, I will con uh, conclude by saying, um, we were talking about community and how we feel individualistic. I would like this conversation to be more community-based, so like, as a group, how do we notice and resist? And then I'm not a bad person by myself. Jack. Uh, and what, sorry, could you, what was the last thing that you said? Um, and then I don't have to feel like a bad person all by myself. Right. And I'm responding correctly to my given culture. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Thanks for that. And like, you know, that is the intention is to really have this be group dialogue for everyone to kind of come forward with their what, what's resonating, what's rubbing, uh, what's not, what's feeling uncomfortable, and then also sharing, you know, we've had a couple classes where people were really sharing a lot of their ways of kind of offsetting or combating or practicing with a lot of these things. I do want to comment about the feeling like, um, of like being a bad, being bad or a lack of ethics. I think I, you're, you're totally right. And that goes back to the conversation that we were just having about like, it's, it's ingrained, it's all pervasive. We, we can't really even see it. And so I'm with you a hundred percent all the way up to the point where we, in our current, in this moment, where we turn and look and, and bring our awareness to our behaviors and our actions. And I think, you know, one of the things that's been coming up for me a lot in this course has been no one that's really coming to this class really needs to know more about ethics. You know, I think that these are conversations more for some of the people that are driving this shit that's more problematic. But once we bring our awareness to some of these behaviors that we might have and we don't change or we don't offset, or we don't come to classes like this, we don't have conversations, we don't speak from the mind and our heart uh, about our concerns about this or explore, you know, you mentioned doing a Google search, like how to live with a lighter carbon footprint. So I definitely agree with the sentiment that no one is bad for being born into, or let me change that word, being indoctrinated into a society like this, for sure. It's just that when we get to a certain point of bringing our awareness to the destruction that we're causing and not taking action is where it becomes problematic. And I also wanna just point, not go too far into this, but point to the difference between guilt and shame, to where shame might be more of the, I'm a bad person, where a lot of these conversations with ethics is more about, I did, it's, uh, am I doing, am I, behaving in a way that's causing destruction or problems versus am I the problem or am I bad? So just, and, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because sometimes guilty can be healthy. It's definitely more healthier than shame, right? For, for um, bringing meaningful change. So I, I really appreciate your point of view and sharing that with us, Cecily. Mm. Angela. Thank you. Um, I think because of these classes, this series of classes we've been doing, I've been thinking more carefully about the word capitalism and trying to see what, what I mean, we use, I, I use the word that comes up very often frequently without very, a very clear understanding of what it is. Um, and, and I'm also fairly alarmed. Uh, so I, I, I live in, in Canada, in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, uh, and we had a lot of smoky days until yesterday, a lot of fires around here. Um, and and the, uh, of housing costs, affordability is becoming such a big crisis here, uh, um, as opposed to what it was 10 years ago. Um, 
and and when I think about capitalism and with this background about affordability that I hear about all the time, uh, I think you know um, capitalism is when profits are more important than people. So how what what is the system we live in where someone's profits are more important than my need for shelter or someone's need for shelter? And and where's the ethics in in how you can a landlord can keep asking for more rent or, or finding tenants that can pay, pay more rent if they can get away with it. Um, when a person needs shelter, I mean, there's no, yeah. The, I, I, so it, it really made me start thinking about uh, capitalism being more about profit than people and, and how basic needs even don't matter as much as as profit and and that really led me to think about what is the ethical what what are ethical obligations in this in this case i i'm i'm maybe just going off on a tangent <laughs> sorry no, that's a big part of this container is to sound things out to hear to hear this because a lot of us are thinking this a lot of us are hearing things and we got all these thoughts and especially in a class like this where a lot of different concepts are being thrown out uh, out into the open. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate you kind of, I, I appreciate all the tangents. Uh, so how does it feel for you to share that? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, to be able to share it. Um, it, it. And I'm also glad to have these spaces to think about it for these questions to arise in my mind. Yeah, a deeper understanding of the system we, we operate under. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And I think that really goes back to what Cecily was sharing, you know, kind of like that we, we're, it, it's painful. It's super painful. It's really uncomfortable. It's really inconvenient that we actually have to turn and look at this, right? So uh, I'm really appreciating this dialogue and, and the kind of we've been talking a lot about it, it requires bravery. Uh, and it requires us learning to be uncomfortable because a lot of, from my point of view, a lot of this is that it's very easy for us to just turn our head. And so this discomfort that's been arising kind of through the, the course of this series is actually really healthy. Uh, as long as we're, 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 made, we're monitoring our zones of experience and what we can tolerate, uh, but it is good to be with the discomfort. Uh, this is part of the, I'm getting a visualization of like a, uh baby chick breaking out of a shell you know kind of like that and it goes back to what karen kind of led us into this idea of like we have to wake up you know we have to become aware that it is everywhere and that we're being conditioned and indoctrinated into it it's not pleasant it's interesting because you know usually not usually but oftentimes as a meditation teacher you're guiding people into a sense of stability of calm and peace or even navigating what it's not and this, this is tough, you know, it's tough to kind of create a space for people to be really uncomfortable and to talk about things and challenge each other and, and share uh, in a very vulnerable way. So, yeah, um, thank you all for kind of contributing to that. Um, so just being mindful of time, I want to wrap up. Uh, Hedonia and kind of nail some things down with you to Monea because I do have another practice that I'd like to spend some time with and then I do want to share um, maybe we'll do this next week I'm kind of already concepting the theme for our gathering next week um, I had planned on sharing some of my experiences uh, what we've been talking about like how I have kind of swung the pendulum you know and renounced my attachments to belongings and but I think what, I, what I'll do for the sake of time, because it's been a really good conversation, is maybe next week is all about sharing how we're doing it, you know? And so we can lead off, I can kind of share a little bit about my story and then less have the class, less about um, teaching and more about everyone kind of bringing to the table things that they might be doing uh, in their own way. Because I think that's the big, big theme here too, is that I don't think any of us are economists. I'm certainly not, uh, but the theme here has really been about how do we how do we take action as individuals here 
and how do we protect our heart and our mind? So with that, let's wrap up. Uh, so I was saying ethical uh, hedonia. So enjoying those external sources of happiness, enjoying those material goods, but also in a way that's ethical, in a way that we're aware of the carbon footprint. We're aware of where it's coming from, the sourcing, the communities that that resource came from or the people that made it. Um, being aware of the carbon footprint of the shipping all over the world, the packaging, all of that kind of stuff. So again, hedonic happiness is not bad. It's just that we have to really monitor that kind of that idea for those of you that were here for the interdependence conversation, where we followed an ingredient from a last meal that we made all the way back. Like today, I was actually thinking about if you were to take a thread from the clothing that you're wearing and follow the life of that thread backwards and then forwards, you know, what happens to it after we're done? So it's just this idea of bringing a sense of awareness to our consumption and doing it ethically. Eudaimonia. So I think that uh, eudaimonia is a tough concept. It's very easy to understand hedonia. It's tangible. It's literally tangible. It's material. Generally, it's a material object or a person or a thing that brings us happiness. Where eudaimonia, it's like really hard to grasp because it's almost like a non-physical idea. Um, and so I like the idea, as I mentioned before, of equanimity, kind of this inner peace, even though it doesn't mean that, you know, for those of you that have sat with me before, you know, that I always say this is not about rainbows and unicorns. Like it is, um, it is about, um, really exploring what it is that allows us to be steady even when the shit storm is going around us. That's eudaimonia, that steadiness, that I can be in all of this stress. And Noam and I were sharing about how we've got all these different things happening in our life right now. It's a little bit overwhelming and kind of hard to keep head on straight, but yet we're anchored in presence. We're anchored in our heart and compassion. It goes back to that first practice. Um, so for me, that's a way, that's one of the ways in for eudaimonia. I have a couple other examples here, you know, so this, the heart brain coherence that we were practicing before, like breathing into the heart, you know, aligning the wavelength of the heart with the brain. So we're centered here rather than this kind of grasping and pushing that's happening out around us with hedonic happiness that we're more kind of grounded in this coherence of, of our mind and our heart. Um, the, uh, I have a couple of things here that I'm just going to list through, um, that I have been thinking about how I cultivate eudaimonia. One that's really important is this getting really clear on what our values are. And this really comes from self-reflection. So getting clear on what truly matters to you and then aligning your actions to those values. That's eudaimonia. There's nothing external with that. That's all coming from within. So it takes some time, you know, to, to really reflect on what are those values? Um, the, the pursuit of virtue and not so we can be this kind of light and love, but so that we can act ethically in a constructive manner. So I think this really goes back to a lot of the concepts that we've been talking about here, courage, bravery, justice, altruism, compassion. These are also things that are not necessarily physical objects. They're coming from within. So um, cultivating our practices, which we'll do in a few minutes to help with that kind of intention to act more ethically. Mindfulness. We've been talking about awareness a lot in this practice. And so you know, for those of you that you heard me sharing, I've kind of shifted out of using the word mindfulness and more into embodied awareness. And so how do we embody an awareness of, of our carbon footprint or um, of the things that are important to us? How do we bring this kind attention into our practice? Um, that's eudaimonia, right? So the mind wanders and we just notice, oh, and then we come back lovingly. That makes sense of my mind wander, very gentle. That's also eudaimonia. That's coming from within. That's not dependent on an external object. 
taking care of ourselves, our emotional well-being, um, not just about meditation, but our mental health, our physical health. There is a blurry line, I think, with Eudaimonia and Hedonia, where, you know, physical, taking care of ourselves, exercise, making sure that we're eating well, hydrating. There is a physical aspect to that because obviously the body is physical. So that's kind of a blurry line for me, but what arises from that, that feeling of when we're taking care of ourselves, and that means something different for all of us, uh, is also Eudaimonia. And then I think a, a last point here that's really important is acts of kindness and service. So that also is more of, it brings us to this place of giving rather than taking. And so right there, you know, Hedonia, Hedonia is more like we're taking, where like when we're in service, when we're expressing gratitude, the conversations we had about gifting economy, that feels like it's coming from a eudaimonia place rather than a hedonic one. So just some reflections on cultivating eudaimonia. I'll share a little bit more about my personal stories with this next week, um, but I would like to spend um, maybe the next 15 minutes in practice. Uh, and so really, as we started our time together tonight with that kind of awareness of the heart center, we're gonna go a little bit deeper here. So there's a teaching around the, the cave of the heart, kind of the windless cave of the heart that our inner light or our eudaimonia lives in. And it's unchanged by the storms that are happening outside that cave. But in this practice, we'll explore this a little bit more. Um, we'll bring some curiosity to what is it like to let go of material objects as the source of our happiness and come inwards. It doesn't mean that the objective of this practice is to look into your heart and find tons of joy. <laughs> it's about turning in and starting to explore that space and see what's there. Okay, so let's start to shift into a, a way of being, whether seated or maybe laying down, perhaps you wanna stand up for this practice perhaps returning to closed eyes or softening the gaze. Starting to bring the awareness inwards once again. And as we make this journey into the inner world, you might notice things in the outer world, sounds, smells, maybe even sensations in the limbs of the body that might pull our awareness out of this inner core. And that's okay. So we can let everything that's happening around us be there. So we start to shift into the inner world. Sometimes I like to think of this as being in a, a busy restaurant with a close friend having a meal. And there's all of this chatter around us. But here I am with my friend listening intently. And so bringing that quality to the heart. Starting to shift our awareness to our friend, the heart center. And as this is described as the windless cave of the heart, perhaps you'd like to bring some visualization into this of the outer point of a cave leading into the heart center. And here in the entrance of the cave, we still have some light from the outside. Perhaps we can consider that Hedonia. seeing this almost as like the outer layer of the heart, the things that bring us joy, the people that bring us happiness, the love that is based on things that are happening around us. It's this outer layer, this entrance into the cave. And if it helps bring your awareness into the heart, you can bring back that aspect of directing the breath into the heart center or visualizing the front of the heart as the entrance to a cave. 
For some, it might be supportive to put one or both hands either on the chest, over the heart, or maybe even bringing one hand over to the opposite shoulder in a half embrace of yourself. Just to bring this awareness to the loving center of the heart. And as we start to travel beyond just the entry to the cave, maybe we notice that light from the external sources starts to dim as we move further into the seat of the heart. And here we might experience a sense of darkness. Maybe the wall that is protecting our heart. Perhaps on the other side of that wall, there might be some wounding or pain or difficulty. All of the ways that we protect our heart, that we seal it off from the outside world. Monitoring your experience here. If this is something that you feel comfortable being with. If not, you can shift your awareness, perhaps back out to the entrance of the cave. But as we travel deeper into this cave, into the darkness, perhaps consider seeing a small dim light deep inside the cave. And there can be storms roaring at the surface of the cave. But here, this flicker of a flame is steady. And beyond the pain and the wounding and the protecting of the heart, we move even closer to this flame this inner light. For those of you that practice Dharma, you may consider this to be your Buddha nature, your inherent goodness, the jewel at the center of the lotus. As you rest here with this gentle light, what is it that you find here inside the heart? Maybe this arises as, the, as an image, maybe a word or a thought. But what's here in the windless cave of the heart? beyond all material objects, beyond the wounding and the armoring, what lies beneath all of that? You notice the mind is wandering away or there's judgments or analysis of this practice, let those be the storms at the entrance of the cave, inviting your awareness back again and again to the windless cave, the eternal flame. Perhaps there's a message here for you. Or perhaps it's just a feeling. There's doubts or fears, any other strong emotions. See what it's like to just give them over to the flame, let them burn, dissolve.
seeing if it's possible to allow this flame, this light in the windless cave of the heart to begin expanding, illuminating the insides of the cave all around you. Be working with the breath, perhaps breathing in to a sense that that light can expand, glow, illuminate, and not just the entire cave, but now pouring outside of it. Maybe you'd like to switch to a visualization of this energy of the heart flooding the entire body. They're allowing that feeling to expand or perhaps visualizing and nurturing energy beginning to stream from the heart and fill the entire body. And remember, this is simply a practice. There's no right or wrong here. Being with your own unique experience and taking care of yourself as you need. And we'll return here to words from Dennis Warren called Going Home. Deep inside of us, we are already complete, already healthy, already exactly as we are supposed to be. We are an interrelated and inseparable part of a perfect universe. We have difficulty seeing and feeling and touching and hearing this perfection from years of being told and believing otherwise. Our vision has become clouded, our feelings dull, our torch numbed, and our hearing faint. We no longer trust ourselves. To cut through this situation and return to our true nature, we need to simply direct our attention inward. We need to sit and meditate. By quieting our minds and opening our hearts, we touch that place deep inside of us that is already whole. Once we reconnect with this source of balance, our life begins to change. We begin to listen to ourselves with care and attention. We seek guidance from within and receive direction. Once we reconnect with this place of inherent wisdom, we begin a journey back home. We begin to trust ourselves. We begin to heal ourselves. From here, letting go of any thought forms or visualization, and just resting in an open awareness of this moment. And reflecting on any insights that may have arisen from your journey into the cave. Reflecting on what this practice may have been like for you, pleasant or unpleasant. And perhaps setting an intention for how you'd like to move forward from this moment. How would you like to embody eudaimonia? Or how would you like to explore cultivating more of it? And 
and an invitation to stay with any insights or wisdom that arose during this practice, even as we start to make a transition out of that formal period of practice. Maybe inviting some gentle stretches as you return back to open eyes. We move on from this practice back into an awareness of our community gathered here. Thank you all for joining me in that practice. We have the rest of our time to just share and kind of debrief what may have come up from that. But I just, you know, it's kind of kismet that our conversation went to the place it did with this poem about how um, the vision becoming clouded, the feelings dulled, the, the touch numbed and the hearing faint it really goes back to that kind of indoctrination into this way of being and the opportunity or the possibility of exploring healing from that in this inner cave. So what was that like? What did you notice when you went into the cave of the heart? Maybe we can start with someone that we haven't heard from yet tonight. And you're all still dwelling. <laughs> so just opening it back up to the group. What was that like? What did you notice? What did you find in the windless cave of the heart? This is Tia. Um, and I um I had a hard time connecting with the cave idea. Um so I wasn't wasn't super settled in it until uh there was the the opportunity to shift to filling the whole body with light. And then I kind of dropped back in, like, okay, this I can this I can do right now, but the the difference, like the light and the dark and the cave, I was having a hard time. Thanks for sharing that. I think that's also a very natural kind of um, experience to, because you have to kind of like journey through this kind of weird, awkward, right? We're kind of like letting go of that orientation to happiness coming from the outside. But I'm curious, so thank you for taking care of yourself, doing what was right for you in that practice. What was it like when you did shift to that moment of the light starting to fill the body? Uh, there was more, uh, more ability to be in the present, more ability to feel, uh, and I'm even doing this with my hands, from my head, through my heart, out into the world. Although that wasn't my experience. My experience, this was from my heart out, but that hand gestures harder. Um, <laughs> but the, the expansiveness was easier to access um, mm -hmm. without the, the going in first. So kind of feeling like I was starting inside allowed the expansiveness to it allowed me to experience feeling expansive in a way that like, okay, I'm going to go in first and then come back out was, I was not, I couldn't hook in. Mm -hmm. is, that the right, is that answering the question you asked? <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, and I think that that's great because what we're really looking at is that this kind of 
eudaimonia is like exactly how you're describing it. It's more of an orientation of outbound. So instead of that kind of pulling in, we're not pushing, but emanating out. And in that practice, it really just stayed with the body. It wasn't really about meta for other people. It was really just kind of touching into that, that source there. That's really, well, actually, I kind of take that back because I think that is probably meta for other people. We were just kind of keeping it within our own body for that exploration. So thank you for sharing that. What else did you notice in that process, in that practice? I had a challenging time shifting perspective as I went into the heart. It was like, am I going in this way? Am I in some external access to a cave? But once I once I finally made the flip and was inside, the cave stuff worked very well for me. Um, I noticed as I got towards the flame and it started illuminating the walls inside my heart, that there was a lot of art expression. For me, that flame had a lot of creativity in it. And it's like, I want to go back and see what else I can find on the interior walls of the heart. That was really interesting. It connected with some of my other practice systems as well, which was which was pretty cool. Um, so I liked it. Thanks, Lance. And I think that brings up a good point. The invitation for all of us, we can always go back, maybe even consider the possibility of living there, living from this place. And you know, we've already heard these two examples of where it was a bit of a bumpy shift as we went in. And I, I think my, my personal kind of interpretation of that is that it's kind of like letting go uh, as we shift inward, it's kind of like letting go of that orientation to the outside world and then carving a channel almost. It's like creating an, a pathway into the cave. And Lance, I really appreciate what you're sharing about your discovery of the, the art and the creativity. I think I, as an artist, I can really relate to that. For me, create, uh, creativity is a source of my eudaimonia. It's not coming from the outside. It's coming from, from within. So I really appreciate that you shared that. Maybe one more real quick before we end up. Anyone else want to share? It's just a very wonderful um, reassuring that it's it's coming home to to myself and to know that I can do that again and again. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Well, thank you all for joining me on this exploration exploration inwards and then kind of the invitation to stay in this place you know explore what we found in the heart and how can we cultivate eudaimonia for ourselves so i listed off a couple of different things that that resonate for me it will be different for all of us but what are the sources of happiness that are not dependent on material objects as kind of this liberation from a destructive orientation that we might be having um, with the world around us and being gentle with ourselves. You know, I think the first step as we've been talking through this whole series is bringing awareness, bringing loving awareness to where our own actions and behaviors might be um, causing difficulty for ourselves, for others, for the planet. And then just rest in that feeling and perhaps an intention or a sense of action will arise from that. Um, but for tonight, really just staying with this felt experience of um, balance between sources of happiness that come from the outside and then our own inner light. So deep bows for everyone showing up. I know that this 
these topics require some courage and bravery. They don't always feel good. So thank you for showing up and doing the difficult work. And I do believe that individually and together, we can do this. Um, it just takes patience, time, and embodied ethics. Uh, so next week will be our last class in the series, uh, an invitation to think for those of you that have been joining for the past um, couple months, or if you'd like to watch some of the videos on YouTube and catch up and then join us next week. Uh, no, no requirement to do that, but next week coming maybe with some of your own point of views on cultivating a sense of embodied ethics in the world that we can all share with each other. Uh, and that's all I got. So we are uh, a Donna run organization. So uh, as we've been talking about this entire series, the Dharma Collective is an embodiment of embodied of, of ethics um, and alternative ways of, of being in the world. So um, these teachings are a free gift. Uh, and so any generosity that you can um, offer in return is more than appreciated to help keep the center running, our teachers compensated. And as always, if even that's just a heartfelt wish for well-being um, and thriving for the center and our community, that's more than enough.